there is one service of worship. There is mm. one liturgy. We are participating in that heavenly service of worship. That's the service of worship that we participate in. Now, how exactly do we participate in it? Well, it's not by sight, it's by faith. Welcome to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss reformed theology, cultural issues, and all things seminary. You're listening to episode 104, and I'm Jared Luchibor. Thank you for tuning in. In today's episode, Reverend Andrew Compton and Dr. Glenn Clary revisit the biblical theology of worship, particularly as they ponder the question, what is going on on a cosmic spiritual level when we gather for corporate worship on the Lord's Day? Later, you know, when you get to the tabernacle era and the temple era, the high priest who serves in the tabernacle and temple is a new Adam figure. And he is, you know, carrying out a work that uh, will fulfill uh, the terms of the covenant that God made with Adam in the beginning. It will also, you know, um, it will also bring about uh, redemption for those who who are fallen creatures in a typological mode. But Christ ultimately is is the high priest, right? They they all are types of Christ, pointing forward uh, to Christ, who is the second Adam, uh, the eschatological Adam, the last Adam. And I should, if I could even add this in, just for the sake of our listeners, because that that can be really surprising. Uh, I'm backtracking a smidge here, but um, with regard to the idea that eschatology precedes soteriology, I know some of our listeners are going to say, "Oh boy, these seminary guys and their words," but you know, what what Glenn is getting at is is how, well, all of us are somewhat tempted to think merely of, um, merely of the transition as being from sinful um, to non-sinful. You know, salvation works in that way, and, and that, you know, our goal is almost to just get back to Eden, where there was no sin again. But that is what's so incredible about the biblical storyline, is that uh, it, it, there is, in fact, this movement from... Um, corruptible to incorruptible that is envisioned, and and I would I would suggest that that was the goal of the tree of life is to is to serve as that as that that sacrament of translation into that heavenly glory. Um, but like you say, it's uh, we, we see already in in creation um, a telos, like a a goal that creation will be transformed uh, into this uh, in, into this consummate glory. Um, not not merely that uh, we will achieve glory out of sin, but but even from the start. It's profound then when we think about um, the, the the whole sort of direction that creation is going or was designed to go, and and where it actually then does go in, in our Lord Jesus Christ in His work as the faithful second Adam, that faithful High Priest who um, who does in fact bring us back to a mountain. You know, it's not just this, this mountain of Eden, but I, I love how Hebrews 12 even talks about, you know, for you've not come to this this mountain of Sinai of blazing fire and all, but you've come now, uh, you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, right? Here's our worship choir yet again in view, in our worship. You know, we're coming, we coming yet again now to that mountain brought there in the train of our faithful high priest. Yes, very good. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Hebrews 12. It's a very, uh, very important text for understanding these things, because in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, the mountain to which we have come is not a mountain that can be seen and touched, hmm. right? It is God's heavenly mountain, his invisible mountain. If you think of heaven, um, you can think of heaven as God's holy mountain, right? His permanent, you know, the ultimate, uh, the holy mountain of God. And on earth, earlier I had mentioned this replication principle, uh, on earth you have these earthly copies and shadows or replicas of the heavenly mountain. And the first earthly copy of the heavenly mountain is Mount Eden. But there are other mountains in Scripture, too, uh, that replicate um, the heavenly mountain of God where his you know, glory spirit dwells. Mount Eden was the first. Mount Ararat would be yeah. another one yeah. in the book of Genesis where uh, Noah offered uh, burnt offerings at Ararat after leaving the ark. 
Uh, Mount Sinai would be another one. That's mm -hmm. one of the easiest ones to see the connection to because at Mount Sinai, you know, the glory of God descends to the summit of the mountain. And then there's Mount Zion, which is another one. Um, and then, you know, ultimately there's the heavenly mountain uh, that we have come to. But those earthly mountains are, are earthly projections of the heavenly mountain of God. They're copies or shadows of the heavenly uh, mountain of God. Now, um, we, you know, kind of we're, we're kind of digging into uh, the middle part of redemptive history here. But if you think about Mount Sinai, where God took Israel after he delivered them from slavery in Egypt, he gave them uh, the plans for the tabernacle. And God told Moses in Exodus 25 to make everything according to the pattern that was shown you in heaven or on the mountain. And that, that pattern that was revealed to Moses on the mountain is the pattern of heaven itself. So that the tabernacle, you know, is, is an earthly copy or replica or shadow of the heavenly mountain uh, of God. And the tabernacle is like a portable mountain, right? The Israelites are at Mount Sinai. That's where they build the tabernacle. And then when they leave the Mount Sinai, they're taking with them, they take the mountain with them in the form mm -hmm. of an you know, uh, architectural, uh, symbolic reproduction of it. Almost. So you have the, the faith, the foot of the mountain, the base of the mountain where all of the Israelites are assembled. And then you have part way up the mountain where uh, Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons and the 70 elders of Israel are allowed to ascend. And then you have the summit of the mountain where Moses alone is allowed to ascend, ascend where those three parts of the mountain, of course, are replicated in the tabernacle. Where you have the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest can go. Then you have the holy place, the sanctuary, where the priest can go. But then you have the outer court, where you know all of the the clean, uh, pure Israelites can go to bring bring their offerings. And so, even the tabernacle tabernacle itself is like a, a miniature mountain. It's also like a miniature cosmos, right? Yeah. It's like a replica of the cosmos. Right, right. Uh, where, where you have the the outer court, and uh, you have the uh, you have uh, the sanctuary itself, which we, both of which would correspond to the visible realms of the visible heaven and, and earth. And then you have the veil or the curtain where only the high, which only the high priest could pass through uh, into the invisible realm, right? The realm that is not seen because it's veiled with mm -hmm. the curtain. Well, that veil corresponds to the firmament, right? That God created in, in Genesis uh, chapter one. So all of this fits together, you know, the, uh, the cosmos itself that God's cre God creates in Genesis chapter one, and then these earthly replicas of the heavenly realms that you see, you know, occurring throughout scripture and how in each case, there's always a man that God places there who's in a covenantal relation with God, who has to fulfill the terms of the covenant, covenant in order to advance from the visible realm into the invisible realm. And of course, all of this is pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, you know, the the last man, the eschatolo you know, eschatological man, uh, and Adam, and the great high priest, who advances right by means of his perfect obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross. He advances uh, from this visible realm to the invisible realm, or to put it more concretely, he ascends into heaven. He and ascends that into heaven, and he sits down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, as Hebrews one. Verse three puts it, and and that really is what is so incredibly profound about what happens in our worship as believers is that uh, it, it, it's sad how we can sort of fall back on on pragmatics a lot in our own worship. You know, we can we can begin to view the Lord's day. You know, oh yeah, this is where we go and we get a Bible teaching and we do some singing. And and for some people in our in our day, that there's this romanticism that has people chiefly questing after the emotional experience of, of maybe a certain kinds of music and worship that makes them feel a certain way better about themselves or gives them psychological resources for getting through a hard week. Or you can take, I don't know, I've called it habitualism, a, a type of approach where, well, I'm going to show my commitment and my piety by showing up in, in church and sitting through a sermon and singing some songs and, you know, boy, we're not, we're not those lazy people, we're not those, those liberals out there, we're taking this serious. And yet what's amazing is even talking through what we've been talking about, and I'm sure some of our listeners 
or maybe be overwhelmed by what, what almost inevitably is like a fire hose of richness in terms of what's happening uh, in in this plan of of uh, plan for history. This 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 forward and upward eschatological thrust. Uh, but is that when we come into worship, we're participating in that history and in that story, and we're drawing near to that very heavenly presence um, through the Spirit uh, in in our union with Christ, and it, it's it it suddenly takes our Sunday and shows us how how cosmic indeed uh, corporate worship is. Yes, yes, it does. It, it puts <laughs> it puts our services of worship on the Lord's day in a whole new perspective. Um, and I think it's so very helpful to understand, uh, what is going on in the realm of the spirit in the realm of glory. Whenever we assemble on earth in the name of Christ, we are participating in the heavenly worship. We are participating Mm -hmm. in the liturgy of heaven. We are joining in with the worship of God that is taking play, taking place in that heavenly temple without ceasing we join our worship to the worship of the angels and to the worship of the saints who've gone on before us and are in the state of glory um it's not like the two are parallel to each other and happening simultaneously it's not like god is being worshiped in the heavenly realm and then there is a separate uh, parallel simultaneous service of worship going on on earth there is one service of worship. There is mm. one liturgy. And we are participating in that heavenly service of worship. We are taking part yeah. in the heavenly liturgy, the same liturgy that you see described in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 4 and 5 and so on, elsewhere in Revelation. That's the service of worship that we participate in. Now, how exactly do we participate in it? Well, it's not by sight, it's by faith, right? Right. Uh, right now, it's not by sight; it's by faith. Whenever right. Christ returns, the, that curtain will be removed. Hmm. You know, heaven will be rolled up like a scroll, and then we will see. You know, then we will see with our eyes yeah. the realm of glory, and we will participate in it that way. And it, well, and it's well, so staggering to think of that as well, because in our worship, we can we can just our, our eyes can get fixed on Canaan, as it were, you know, and not to the, not to that heavenly reality. You know, we can, oh, well, we're in benches and we have books and pastors in a suit or in a robe or, you know, and and we just get caught up in these, um, these, these things that truly are facilitating our worship. But Mm -hmm. because we can't see that heavenly reality, we, we, we can, um, sort of natural we we can forget that in fact that's that is happening like you say it's intertwined i mean some people this is going right. to get kind of weird thinking uh, in science fiction terms but some have even invoked the the idea of another dimension to our reality uh, that that yes. is that is corresponding to it yes and, and and i think you know hebrews 12 makes it clear right you have come yeah to the heavenly mountain what is at that heavenly mountain well, it's the angels in festal gathering. Goodness. Right? It's the, the spirits of those made righteous. You know, this is where we are, you know. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's so, uh, you know, easy to forget that uh, and to think only in terms of what we see, think only of, you know, in terms of our human uh, perspective. But, but we've got to remember that our worship leader is Christ himself, hmm. right? We are worshiping in a temple, not an earthly temple, not a shadow, not a copy, not an earthly replica of the heavenly temple. We are worshiping in the heavenly temple. And we are being led in that service of worship by Christ himself because he's the high priest of that heavenly temple. And how is it that we are we are joined to him. Well, it's by means of the Holy Spirit. When Christ gave the Spirit to the church, that Spirit who is poured out on the church and who indwells in every believer unites us to the ascended Christ so that we are, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, we are seated with him in the heavenly places, right? We are already united to Christ uh, in his resurrection and ascension by means of our spiritual union to Christ. 
Now, I know we don't see that, uh, and we won't see that until Christ returns, but nevertheless, that is that is a reality uh, for us. And that spiritual union with Christ is something that cannot be severed. It cannot be broken. And so our worship on earth, as mundane as it may seem sometimes, yeah. right, <laughs> as boring as it may seem sometimes, yeah. and as flawed as it may be at some times, with all of its irregularities, with all of its imperfections and so on, and we are still, you know, imperfect creatures, and we're always going to face things like this uh, in worship on earth. Nevertheless, we can't forget, um, you know, there is a reality that we don't see. There is a reality to our liturgy that is veiled to us that we don't see, but it's real. Yeah, it is absolute real and it's real because christ is real and mm. christ is there and we are in christ we're united to christ by the spirit and that's the liturgy that we are participating in now having said that i think you know um we could go to the opposite extreme of kind of discounting all earthly things sure, uh, sure. like for example baptism or you know bread and wine that's just water it's just bread it's just wine these are only earthly things do we really need these if we participate in the <laughs> heavenly liturgy well yes we do need them because we have not we ourselves have not been fully eschatologized right we we are not living in the state of, in the state of consummation in the state of glory we are still earthly creatures <laughs> right um the spirit indwells us and unites us to the to the risen and ascended Christ, but we ourselves have not been glorified. So we still have these earthly matters to our worship. And I think, Andrew, maybe it would be helpful to think about our our worship as something that is not fully eschatological. That is something that will come about when Christ returns. Our worship will be fully, completely eschatologized at that point when Christ returns. But now it is semi-eschatological, right? Right. It's not sub-eschatological mm -hmm. or pre-eschatological like it was in the Old Testament where the people of God worshiped in copies, types, and shadows. It Because those types and shadows have given way to the reality that they foresignified, that they typified, and that is Jesus Christ. So our worship now is in spirit and in truth. It's not in a typological mode. It is in the mode of the reality, the truth, and in the realm of the spirit. Yeah. And nevertheless, it is not fully eschatologized. It's it's semi-eschatologized or partially eschatologized, if we can put it that way. Yeah, this is a great perspective uh, on on all of this. And, and again, it you know we um, we have such a rich portrait in Scripture of this telos of creation, a, a telos that is not simply a movement from from sin to redemption. But even from the perfect creation to the consummate new heavens and new earth, and you know, and and our focus right here in our in our episodes that we're looking at right now has been on on our corporate worship as a church, how how this relates. But but this has implications for all of life, right? We can we can live um, with such pressing concerns uh, overwhelming us. You know, we just go to work, you know, punch the clock. Uh, you know, get kids to Little League, get, get you know, boom, 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 everything very mundane, very limited, and and be neglecting the great comfort and the, the great meaning that comes from knowing that even these events are taking place within this, uh, within this already and not yet, this, this, um, this, uh, this semi-realized eschatology already, which gives us profound meaning then for why our work day to day is valuable and indeed why our worship is so valuable as well it, it's it's a, it's it's no mere it's no mere mundane concern but it is is as it were tapping into that very reality and that's why you know um it's very important that our worship on the lord's day have that heavenly nature and that heavenly orientation because it is our participation in worship on the lord's day where we are reoriented right yeah. Uh, we are reminded of our pilgrim identity. Mm -hmm, right? We are mm -hmm. we are strangers and aliens living in exile on the earth, and we are seeking a better country. And uh, you know, worship reorients us toward that heavenly goal. Goal that reorients us toward the consummation, toward yeah. the return of Christ, who, as the high priest, will you know draw back the curtain, permanently remove the curtain, and we will see his see his appearing. 
Um, but if we, you know, um, if we try to make worship simply a form of entertainment or something like that, or if we try, you know, to make it something only mundane, something that has to do, you know, with, um, <laughs> uh, you know, with the mundane realities that we face in life, because it's got to be relevant, it's got to be practical. So all in the names of relevance and, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, all in the name of relevance, we got to turn, you know, our worship into something that is focused on the here and now, then we're missing the whole point of worship altogether. The whole point of worship altogether is to orient us toward that upward and final consummate end and in our worship we're participating in that and it's redirecting us toward that end and all of our life you know needs to be oriented that way if if then you have been raised with christ paul says in colossians 3 1 set your mind on things that are above not on things that are below because christ is seated in the heavenly place and your life is hidden with christ and when christ who is our life appears then we also will appear with him in glory so it's that heavenly orientation i think that worship must have in order to reorient us Dr. J. Mark Beach, Professor of Doctrinal and Ministerial Studies here at the seminary, joins Reverend Compton and Dr. Clary next time on the podcast as they explore Reformed worship and liturgy, its history, key elements, and the importance of those elements of Reformed worship. You can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.